All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. You are at the absolute very first program into our big year of bugs here at Three Rivers Park District. <laughs> it's exciting, yeah. You have come to our speaker series event. This is an event that's taking place all winter long. Um, and we'll have six different professional speakers in the world of entomology talking about their research and their specialties. So it will be really exciting to get to learn together with you as part of this series. Today, we have Chad Hines here, who is a wonderful, amazing expert in the world of spiders. Um, we will get started here with Chad as I pass over the microphone. If you have questions or concerns throughout the program, please feel free to reach out to me. My name is Bailey. I'm an interpretive naturalist here at Silverwood. Thank you so much all for being here today and being excited about these spiders. First of all, I should introduce myself. Uh, so uh, I come from the wilds of Manitoba, Minnesota, South Central Minnesota. Uh, I have a remark for the audience. Oh, that's a lot longer than I thought it was. I just think of the cities, but I normally think of the South Side, not where we are today. And I thought, oh, it's taking me a little longer to get here. Uh, I teach in the biology department at Bethany Lutheran College in Mankin, a small private liberal arts college uh, right there. I did not get there because I knew stuff about spiders. I got into spiders because I teach biology. Uh, my background is actually in birds. Um, I actually still do study in birds. Uh, my master's degree is in plants, and somehow along the way, while I was looking at plants, I got interested in smaller bugs, butterflies, and dragonflies, and eventually spiders. And uh, I was not actually interested in spiders, but at some point, I got a little bit more interested in them, and then I realized that we don't actually know anything about them. And when you find something that nobody knows anything about, it's really easy to become an expert <laughs> because nobody knows anything. So uh, that's kind of how I uh, got into spiders. And I've been doing this now for, I think 06 was my soft start. And then my diehard start was probably around 2009 or something like that. Let me see if I can get my clicker to work here. No, it's, it's, it's fighting me. Hold on. Oh, there we go. I want to at least tell you where I'm going to go. I'm going to tell you a little bit how I got interested in spiders. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about spider biology, uh, kind of know what a spider is. You know, if you had to get inside the mind of a spider, what is a spider? How does it think? What does it do? That sort of thing. We'll do a little bit of anatomy because I'm a biology teacher. It's mandatory that you have to learn some anatomy and some other things, right? And then uh, uh, really throughout this, Diversity is a big thing for me. I'm really interested in diversity, whether it's spiders or birds or whatever it might be. Uh, so uh, we've got some, uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that kind of throughout this, but then I'm going to try and address some of the main questions I get asked about spiders. And then finally, I'm just going to tell you why you should become interested in spiders. Yeah. And that's when I found out I was going to have to sit here at the podium. There we go. I'm a, I'm a storyteller. You can ask my students. Um, so I'm going to do a lot of pictures, not a lot of text, but I have stories that go with all these. So um, I, again, was, was kind of interested in, in diversity and interested in other things. The spider on the left here, this is called the uh, Eastern Parson spider. You'll find that there's not a lot of common names that are in use with spiders. Um, so the, the fun name for it is Herpulus ecclesiasticus, which makes you sound a lot smarter. Okay, uh, but I was uh, studying arthropods with my students, and it just so happened that the unit on arthropods lined up with March. Anyone been outside looking for insects and other things in March? It's not exactly the easiest thing. So um, I had learned that if you find a dead tree and you peel back the bark, you'll find some interesting arthropods under there. You'll find some wood lice, you'll find some centipedes, and maybe some millipedes, and there are some spiders. And so I was out with students, actually collecting whatever we could find behind bark and studying them uh, as we learned about arthropods. And this is actually one of the first spiders that I remember I was able to successfully identify, the Eastern Parson spider. It's 
It's actually fairly uh, straightforward in its identification. It's got the nice white collar, just like the Parson. Helps me to remember what it is. Um, at the same time, um, I was doing some kind of like some biological inventory work. I had collected the uh, the spider on the upper right there. This is a uh, it's called a Hoy's jumper. Oh, that worked. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, this is called a Hoy's jumper. I had no idea what it was. I took its picture. I let it go. Didn't know what it was. Still didn't know what it was for like two, three, four years. Now I'm looking and I go, well, oh, it's a Hoy's jumper. But, um, you know, when you're first starting out, everything's a little bit unfamiliar. Uh, and then the one down on the right was kind of there when I first started getting a little bit more serious about it. I started, uh, we were doing a summer science camp at Bethany, and I was thinking, oh, how can I get kids into diversity? You know, you can't go places with them in vehicles without having all these written permission slips and liability issues. We'll just, we'll just focus on jumping spiders. Why not? We'll, we'll take a look and we'll see what spiders are found on buildings, what spiders are found in the woods, and then we'll compare the two communities. I thought it'd be kind of a fun thing. And in my prep work, I thought, well, I probably ought to look like I know what I'm talking about. So I went out and collected some spiders off of those places to see if I could figure out what they are. So we could be all smart guy. So it was. And I had no idea what this was. And honestly, um, uh, there wasn't many resources that were available when I was first getting into this. Um, there were, there's a couple of websites now that really are kind of in many respects. Amazing place to get lost to try to figure out what things are. But it wasn't there really. Um, it was kind of at the forefront, not much. And again, um, I posted a picture like this to a wonderful website called Bug Guy, and it remained unidentified for years. But people just didn't know, didn't know anything about it. But I was starting to realize okay, I could take some decent pictures of these things. Maybe somebody will help to figure out. This is kind of how I wandered down that little. Uh, I started wondering, okay, what's there? And, and it wasn't just one species, it was two species, three species, and four species. You know, it's got a snowball, so uh, you get the one on that sort of thing. So we got to talk about what a spider is. It's an arachnid. If you have arachnophobia, you can't be just afraid of spiders. You have to be afraid of everything over here, too. Okay? <laughs> These are all arachnids. So, and they're all found here in Minnesota. So right here, we have an American dog tick. These things have a fun name. They're called sumo mites. Ticks, we've got mites. These are daddy long legs or harvest men. And then down on the bottom here are one of my favorite creatures, of course, are super scorpions. Also, stay around their tail and they're about the size of a pencil tail. Very tiny. We're digging through the leaf and we find them. Once in a while, you find them in a sink inside because they like moisture. But these are all uh, arachnids. This, of course, is the spider. Hopefully, you picked up on that. Okay, that's the spider. Um, and so uh, there are um, lots of different spiders. Probably the big prevailing thing, we start thinking about, okay, what is a spider and how does it work? Uh, I think of spider. First thing you should come to mind is a spider is a carnivore. You know, normally we jump to the mountain lion, usually bear the, the timber wolf or something really large and carnivorous, but it's actually. There are a lot more carnivores wandering around us all the time. They actually do a lot of controlling of a lot of the insect pests that we're, we're so worried about. Some of them, like our uh, orb meter here on the left, this is Neoscona crucifera, or it goes by the name of cross spider, but there's a couple of spiders that go by that name. So it also goes by the name of spotted orb weaver, uh, but they make a web. And we've probably seen that or read about that in E.B. White Charlotte's web, right? made that beautiful web and she caught flies and things in it, right? Classic spider sitting and waiting in, in, in their web to catch something. Uh, but some of them actually sit in flowers and they wait for pollinators like this little fly to show up and get something to eat and lo and behold that little part isn't actually a petal. It's a spider who's been waiting just for that moment. And they grab them and eat them. So, uh, and they'll tackle things that are much larger than themselves. Um, this is a jumping spider, and uh, one of my favorites uh, out, of, out of all the spiders that are out there, jumping spiders, I think, are probably the most engaging. Uh, there's a story that goes along with this spider. I was sitting on the banks of the Namakagan River up in northern Wisconsin. It's part of a, a 
the Namakaga National Scenic Riverway. Just this beautiful scenery. And all of a sudden, this jumping spider hopped off the plant next to me, landed on my leg as I pivoted my camera into action to take a picture of this jumping spider on my leg. This jumping spider jumped on it and grabbed it. <laughs> they eat all sorts of things, including other spiders. Uh, and that's the fun thing about spiders. If I'm out going and collecting spiders, you put one in every jar. If you put two in the jar, you end up with one spider and one has been meal of the other one. Um, so they are deeply ingrained in being carnivores. And even if we take a closer look at them, uh, we, this is actually a spider that's probably no bigger than an eraser on a pencil. Uh, and uh, it has right up in the front, this does not look like something that's a friendly animal. It wants to read out, reach out and pet you, right? No, it's got big fangs and it's got these, uh, these spines on here to help it to hold the prey uh, while it is munching up, okay? And if we look at long-jawed orb weavers, boy, do they have fangs, okay? These are carnivores and they are thinking about food all the time, even when I'm using a sweet net. You sweep up a whole bunch of insect prey and spiders and other things. Boy, it's so much fun to watch those spiders. And they found something in that mass of insects that you've swept up. They're so happy and they're carrying it around because you just brought a meal to them. They are thinking about food almost all the time. Okay, And food is anything they can really uh, get their, their fangs into that they think will uh, provide a good meal. It could be your boyfriend or girlfriend, too. Okay. So let's do a little uh, anatomy. Again, I told you there has to be some academic part of this. So this is a, a, a typical spider. This is a type of brown spider. Um, I think this is Drosodes saccata. No common ones, remember? Um, so we have two body parts in every spider. If we were to go back and think about our, our other arachnids, almost all of them have just one body part. And that's about all there is. But here we've got two. We've got that front one. This is called the, the cephalothorax. Some, some people call it the prosoma, or otherwise known as the first segment. And then we have the abdomen that's back here. I like to use cephalothorax and abdomen simply because cephala is typically head, thorax is chest. And if you can imagine your head and your chest and no neck, you'd be like the spider, okay? And then we all have an abdomen. And we know that inside the abdomen, there are a number of important organs uh, that carry out uh, important functions, and that's true for our, our spiders here as well. Um, like other arachnids, they do have eight walking legs, unless you've accidentally pulled one off. Um, and uh, those are used for moving, so uh, the nice thing is they're normally balanced. So we've got one, this, this one's kind of sticking up a little bit, two, three, four. Those are our four walking legs on this side, and of course we should find four on the other side. And then we've got these Cute little appendages up here in the front. These are called the pedipulps. Sometimes we just call them the palps. And in spiders, uh, in girl spiders like this one, this is primarily for sensory function. It's kind of a reach out, touch your world, experience it, see what it's like, that sort of thing. Might be used a little bit sometimes to help manipulate prey and get it closer into the mouth so that they can eat. But in males, um, and we're going to talk about this, uh, in males, this actually ends up serving as the copulatory organ. Um, this is a means of transferring sperm from male to female. And we'll see what that looks like in a little bit here. Polyceri, uh, think of it in terms of jaws. Uh, this is a wolf spider. And we can see that they uh, wolf spiders have two pretty big, massive polyceri. And this is where the fangs are located. So they have one on each side. They've got fangs in there. Those uh, fangs, of course, are connected to the venom glands. We'll talk a little bit about that later, too. Um, so they got two of those. Uh, they have, uh, at the back end, they have spinnerets, and uh, typically we see three pairs, so that adds up to six. If I'm doing my math correctly, I teach biology, not, not mathematics. Uh, but we end up with six at the tail end, and these are connected to the silk glands, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the silk glands here in a second, too. Uh, but they're primarily there for kind of manipulating and, and moving the silk and making it do whatever the uh, spider needs to do. And then, of course, we have eyes. And unlike you and I, they do not have two, even though this wolf spider is showing two big ones right up here. If you look underneath, there are one, two, three, four more underneath that. That's six. And there's one back here. 
There's another one back there. There's eight eyes. Most of Minnesota spiders have eight eyes, which is nice. Um, there are a couple of species that only have six. Uh, in the world, there are actually some that don't have any eyes at all. Can you think of where a spider with no eyes would be found? In a cave. If there's no light, why have eyes? Uh, and so uh, we do actually have some caves here in Minnesota. Uh, and uh, I've got a, an open invitation from the people down at Mr. Cave State Park to come down and look for spiders in their caves because they just did a whole fauna survey of their cave system. And the people who came in and did it found the spider. And I emailed them. I said, well, what spider did they get? And they said, well, we only know what family. I said, well, you should have sent the spiders to me instead. We would have gotten those things figured out. Um, but we do have them. Unfortunately, the species that we have here, they've got eyes. It's okay. So anywhere from zero to eight, but most times it's eight. Uh, and the eyes really tell me a lot. I'm looking at a spider. It helps me to identify what the spider is. Uh, but it also tells me a lot about its own uh, natural history. So here's three different spiders. Nice close up. So you have to understand a lot of the work that I do. I collect the spiders. They're live for a while. I might take their pictures. And then they go into alcohol. And I have some uh, because it's going to help you to have the reaction time that you need. And so when we look at our crab spiders, again, that's the one on the left here. That is, uh, we've got a couple of eyes that are pointed toward the front. But we also have them definitely hanging to the sides. Thank you, Bailey. And then to the back. So uh, we can see there's there's actually a protuberance right here, and the lens of that eye is right here. It's actually looking right behind it. So having eight eyes can be handy if you point them in different directions, right? Uh, this is probably a more typical of arrangement for most spiders. It's two rows of four. Sometimes they're bent in a frowny face. Sometimes they're bent in a smiley face, okay? <laughs> Uh, but uh, there's normally two rows of four. And even if we were to look at our crab spider, we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So two rows is kind of standard for what we see uh, in spiders. But we don't really see, they're all pretty much about the same size. And that's often typical. Notice that in the crab spider, we have a couple bigger ones and a couple of little ones. This is an active hunter. This is a lynx spider. This is a striped lynx. And um, just like our wolf spider, which had those big eyes right up in the front, those big eyes up in the front, binocular vision, that means they look a lot like you and I. We're very visual. The human race is very visual. We're looking for things. And a lynx spider uh, behaves a lot like a cat. Uh, and it's a very appropriately named. It jumps from place to place within the vegetation and actively hunts things. And it has two big eyes that are up here in the front with two little ones underneath it, one to the side, one to the side, and then he's got two back here. Different spiders, different eyes. Here's just a couple of other eye arrangements. We could be just looking at eyes all day if we really wanted to. Um, but um, these are dwarf spiders, which makes them fun because they've got lumpy heads. Or this is Dipoena nigra. This is a, a cobweb spider. It just has this large clump. But we have two of them clustered together and one up on the top. Here's one that's got Two on the top, and then it's got four down here, and then there's one that's like three back here and one way back on the other side. Different spiders, different eye arrangements. Orb leaders typically have a, a tetrad, a group of four in the middle, and then they have two that are off to one side, two that are off to the other side. This is a cellar spider. They've got two groups of three with two little ones in between. And then, of course, jumping spiders, which are my favorite. Um, they have eight eyes. They have two really big eyes up in the front, and uh, jumping spiders have very good vision, some of the best vision of all invertebrates. And they uh, they track prey. They've done studies, and, and you put them in front of the French Open, and they're watching things. It's a yellow ball. It's going back and forth, and they will track it and follow it. Um, they're very visual. If you go looking at a jumping spider, the jumping spider will instantly orient itself and look right back at you which makes them kind of cute and endearing and a great way to get to know your spiders because uh, they're normally not hostile at all. They're just kind of cute and curious. But they have uh, two big eyes. Whoops, I pushed a button. Wrong button. Wasn't bailing this time. Um, two big eyes in the front with two on the sides. There's a pinprick of an eye right there. And then they have one to the rear as well. Uh, and again, they're, uh, they're visually oriented. 
Um, so they're they're active hunters. They're looking for prey or in their environment, which means if you want to find a jumping spider, go out during the day. At night, they're sleeping. Okay. And the neat thing is, uh, if we're looking at how they get put together, so we talked about these spinnerets. Again, this is uh, we, if we look at a, a spider at the, and look at their spinnerets, we see the silk is coming right up. But they have these different glands, and they can combine things differently. So out of the same spigot, we can get different types of silk. We just assemble it there. We simply make a different concoction. It's like going up to one of those restaurants where you go, okay, I want Coke, and I want orange, and I want Sprite. You know, you can't give the... They, they see that they can have all the varieties, and they go with all of them, right? Same thing here. It comes out of the same spigot, but we end up with different things. So spider silk itself, it's made out of protein. So the nice thing about it is it is degradable, okay? Um, but depending on what type of silk you're dealing with, it might be very elastic. Normally, the ones that you walk through have some elasticity to them, which is why they stick to you, and then you're walking, and it's still sticking to the tree, and you are definitely feeling the tension there, okay? Uh, and But they also have a very high tensile strength. Um, and different types of silk, can be used for different purposes. So, um, even within an org web like this, some of those threads are designed to be sticky. Others are designed to be not sticky so that the spider can walk around without getting caught. You can make uh, different structures from the silk itself. And so uh, depending on what the spider wants to make, it can combine the proteins differently and make a different type of silk, which is just absolutely fascinating. And uh, if I was a material scientist, I'd keep on going, but I'm not that material scientists. I'm more into uh, our spiders. So uh, webs are probably the typical application that we see, and this is probably the typical web. If we think of a spider web, we normally think of those nice, uh, the, the spiral, right? We've got different uh, uh, radii that kind of come out from a middle part, and then we've got this around. This is an orb weaver's web, and there are several species of orb weaver that are found here in Minnesota. That's a typical web, but that's not the only kind of web. Webs can actually come in a couple of different forms. Uh, the dictinids normally make a, a very tight tangle of webs up at the tip of vegetation. Uh, so if you're walking through a prairie during the summer and you see last year's vegetation and you look closely at the tip, you will invariably find there is a tiny little spider sitting in a tangle of webs that are up here at the end. And they always have prey, so there must be something flying around in there. Sheep webs. Our, uh, this is a, a small spider. Uh, this is made by, I looked it up before. I, 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 I took a picture of the web, then I caught the spider, and I thought, that's being smart. And then you can't remember the name, and it doesn't look so smart. Uh, this is a sheet web, and this is another sheet web here. This one's called the bowl, bowl and doily spider. We can see the bowl. Here's the doily. And up above it, there's a tangle of spider web, spider silk that's kind of all over the place. So you got a fly that's just Minding its own business, flies into one of these tangled lines, hits that, oh, crash and burn. And the spider is actually this dark dot right there. She's just sitting there waiting for something to tangle down into the bowl. And this will chase up to it and bite it and then eat it. Um, so webs take on a wide variety of different forms. And not all spiders actually make a web. Again, some of the active hunters, like jumping spiders and bull spiders, they're going to use silk for different purposes. They do, they're active hunters. Uh, they don't spin any type of web uh, whatsoever. They still have silk. They still use silk, uh, but they're not using it for webs. If you want to learn more about that, um, Minnesota's own Larry Weber does have a book out there called Web Watching, uh, a guide to the webs and spiders that make them. Um, Larry's out of the Duluth area up north, and, and he is uh, he and I have oftentimes gone back and forth because at one point he knew more than I did and then I at one point he does, he still knows more natural history than I do. He's, he's incredible. Larry Weber. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah, and he's not just a spider expert. He's a, he's an expert on all sorts of natural history. of mine. It's, it's awesome. Um, other uses for silk. This is a bronze jumper and uh, it has a, a struck a very odd pose here. It has its butt up in the air. I'm sorry, it's abdomen, we just learned up in the air, and you can kind of see its spinnerets are kind of pointed up, kind of in a general area. You might recall that at the end of, of Charlotte's web, all of Charlotte's children are floating off 
into space, right? Well, that's what this jumping spider is trying to do. He's putting out silk. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to you put out enough silk, you get enough drag, the wind takes you, and you let go, and away you go. Um, spiders use this to kind of, oftentimes it's young spiders that use this to disperse uh, after the breeding season. But you will also find that adults use it from time to time. They will also put down safety lines. Jumping spiders are known for jumping across chasms in order to catch prey or whatever. Before they jump, they touch the back end of their abdomen to the ground. That's attaching the safety line, and then they jump. So if anyone's from OSHA, it's okay. <laughs> they're going to be fine, okay? Uh, but there is a, a safety line, and most spiders work with a safety line. So when we're sweeping up in the corners of our house, we're not normally sweeping up webs. We're sweeping up safety lines that the spiders that have been roaming around our house were using to make sure that they didn't get hurt at work. Uh, they also uh, make egg cases. So uh, down here we have a, a common jumping spider. This is Pardosa distincta, and she is carrying around an egg case. So there might be as many as 30 different eggs that are inside of this egg case, and she's going to carry them around until they're mature. Others might attach them on the underside of a leaf, or if you catch one, they might even put one in your jar. But they take on a wide variety of different forms, from smooth white golf ball to orangish, yellow, sticky thing to lumpy, I don't know what. Uh, but different spiders make different egg cases. Some of them, it almost looks like, right, what do I call it? It almost looks like a silken puddle. It's just flat. It doesn't look like anything else. Um, so different spiders, different egg cases. Uh, but that's another use that they use their silk for. And again, this isn't designed to be sticky. It's not trying to capture anything. It's designed to protect the eggs that are on the inside. So if you were to tear that apart, you got to take two forceps and really work on it because it has very high tensile strength. They also make you treats um, and hide away. So uh, here's a running crab spider. I found a leaf that was folded up, and as I unfolded it, there was a, a, a little web retreat that was on the inside here. And it was actually the, the leaf was all rolled up and reattached, and she was hiding in there. And she had an egg case in there, too. The same thing is happening right here, only it's much more camouflage. This is the work of uh, spiders in the genus Flaviona. These are called sack spiders. And they actually take uh, thick, you walk through wetland grasses that have thicker parts to them, or if it's a thicker grass. You look carefully, once you get to about midsummer, that's about when sack spiders are breeding, and you will find that they do this fun little octagonal bending of the grass stem. And inside that, there's a spider with her eggs, and she's guarding them. Um, and uh, so they make a, a, a fun little retreat. So we can use that silk for a number of different purposes. So uh, boys and girls, we have males and we have females. Sometimes it's real obvious which one's a male and which one's a female male because they're what we refer to as sexually dimorphic. They have different appearances to them. So these are jumping spiders. Uh, these are uh, jumping spiders in the, in the genus Habernatus, Habernatus aptiosus. This is a male and a female. I actually collected them together. One of my, I was out hiking at a, a wildlife management area with my kids, and one of my kids says, what the heck is that, Dad? And, of course, I have to know. So I went over and looked, and I went, holy cow, it's a male and a female. Top one here is uh, Clubiona obesa. And the bottom one here is Clubiona castoni, and you can't tell the difference until you look at the epigena. I was I was given a hard time once. I was, I was telling people, well, you know, it's kind of like a Warshak test. You kind of well, what do you see in there? Like this one looks like an owl to me. I don't know why. It just looks like an owl looking back at me. That doesn't look anything like an owl. You know, I, I don't know. It doesn't have anything it looks like. Um, these structures, by the way, that we could see through there, these store the sperm. So when the male transfers the sperm, she stores them for a while, and then when she lays the eggs, it's basically like, okay, one sperm, one egg, one sperm, one egg, put them together, okay. right? That sort of thing. This is the male side of things. And this is the really cool part about uh, all of this biology and why it matters uh, about what the shape of the reproductive structures are. And that is because it is designed kind of like a lock and a key. This is... This palp here goes with this one, but it will not lock up with this one. So it is designed to ensure that when he is transferring sperm from himself to her, that that connection remains connected. 
And so on the side here, we've got, this is a parasymbium. We have a little hook structure here called the, uh, the embolus that comes up over the top. These are all designed to lock up with this while the sperm is being transferred. And sometimes if she makes a move to grab something to eat by something to eat, I mean him, uh, he will actually just pull really hard and he'll leave that attached to her. So sometimes I'll collect a spider where he's already missing one of his pedipulps because he had a close call with his lady friend, okay? Uh, but each one of those male pulps then is designed specifically. So when we're looking at the males in order to figure out not only is it a female, which species it is female, and which species it is male, we also have to look at the pulp on the male side of things. So I do a lot of micro dissection work. Um, this past week, I dissected a, the female reproductive system out of a spider that was about the size of a pencil tip. So as I get older, I'm finding this is getting harder for some reason. Maybe some of you who are a little older than I am might appreciate that. I'm just not as steady as I used to be, but uh, it worked out pretty nicely. This is just to show there's just a lot of different shapes and sizes and forms in these pedipulps, and, and that's why it makes a difference. So this is a wolf spider. This is a brown recluse. This is a, a Zeistica spherex. This is a crab spider. And this is, uh, it's got to be Scottinella pugnata or something. It's a Scottinella. It has this awesome hook to, to again, help with latching up and, and remaining connected to the female during uh, that transfer process. Um, so male structures. So there's this sculpted art and each one of these spiders too. So we've got the spider as a whole. And then if we narrow in and look at just reproductive structures, there's a whole other world of, of just beautiful structures to look at, which is something I think that's kind of sucked me into all of it as well. So I'm going to get into some of our common questions. I'm watching my time in the back. I know we're going to run over a little bit and she's going to forgive me. She's waving her hands, giving me the okay. Um, but we're... Uh, We'll deal with some of the common questions I get asked. So I often am asked, well, how big is the largest spider in Minnesota? That's it right there. It's called Dolomenes tenebrosus. There's actually a couple of members in the genus Dolomenes that are quite large. Um, they're probably about the size, with the legs, about the size of my palm. Okay, harmless, but big. As my wife says, well, those are the scary ones. So she'll catch the little ones in the house. Every once in a while we find a Dolomenes tenebrosus in the house. She's not good with that. Uh, I can't cure her. I've tried. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum, we have something as small as this is a male, Ceratisilus emertoni, and they are a pinprick of a spider. Uh, very tiny. Like if uh, I have one in a jar up here, sometimes it's a leap of faith. You have to just believe that it's there because um, they are very tiny. So our spiders can be pretty big. They can also be pretty small. Um, there's a wide, uh, wide range of sizes that they come in. Um, I'm often asked, well, how many spiders are there in uh, Minnesota? I don't honestly know. I'm working on it, okay? Um, initial estimates, somewhere around 600. I think that might be on the low end of things. I think it's probably going to be closer to 800. It might even be closer to 900 or 1,000, but we don't know. And there's one of me, and there's 87 counties. So I'm getting there. It's just going slow. Um, but we're trying to figure things out as we go. So what I have confirmed so far is 36 different families, 209 genera, and 531 species. This is 531 right here. I just uh, was working in my lab this week. It's a spider I collected up in uh, northern Minnesota. Just a generic brown spider. Doesn't look like anything at all. But lo and behold, it was a new species for Minnesota. It's called Haplo Haplodran Haplodrasus unis. Uh, it has no common name to it. Um, it's found in the mountainous western United States and it, supposedly across Canada. And it was hypothetical in Minnesota until I found it uh, this summer. Uh, at the end of July, it was. Um, but the nice thing about doing spider stuff is you can collect them in the summer and you can still look at them while it's cold outside like it is today, which sometimes is better than going birding in this kind of weather. You know, it can be a little cold. I still think there's another family, 28 genera, and 131 species. That's just on my hypothetical list. And I think my hypothetical list is just conservative. Um, the hypotheticals are there simply because they're either records from an adjacent state or it has a propensity to be kind of found all over the place. Uh, the problem is we don't know enough about spiders, and therefore the published ranges are really hard to work with. 
Um, so we just don't know where the spiders are. So um, the first draft of my, my checklist, it took me about two and a half years to really go through all the literature uh, and find out what species are supposed to be here. I then went out to Minneopolis State Park, was in the woods, found a spider. I knew what the spider was. Doggone it, it wasn't on my list. And that's when I knew that my list wasn't very good. Um, and probably since I started collecting spiders, I have found, I don't know, 80 new species for the state of Minnesota. Um, I, had a, I had a spider guy this summer. He chewed me out. And he said, well, you should have published that list 15 years ago. And then every time you found something new, you could publish again. And I said, that sounds like a lot of work. Maybe I'll just keep working on what I've got here. And we'll just keep adding to it as we go. Um, we don't really know that much about spider distribution. So if we were to take a typical species, uh, this is a, a common jumping spider. Uh, but if we were to take a, a, any species at random, uh, typically uh, the likelihood it might be known from nine of 87 counties in Minnesota. We just don't know where they all are. Okay, um, So pick out one randomly. There are some, this one's been found in 75 counties. So we only have 12 to go. And then we know it's all over the state, um, but most of them are one or less. Uh, uh, even on the list of the hypotheticals, those are the ones that, of course, that are less. If we look at the cat counties themselves, uh, the average, I think, when I started it was somewhere around 22 or something like that. We're up to 54 on average in counties, and it ranges anywhere from some counties have 13 and some have 215. Anyone want to know which county has the most? That's a good guess. You guess St. Louis County, which is Duluth and points north. And it is in the top five, but it's not the high one. Either this side of the road or the other side, either Ramsey or Hennepin. It's Hennepin. And a lot of that just comes back to the fact that there are more people in Hennepin than anywhere else in the state. And uh, the University of Minnesota is in Hennepin, and uh, it's in Hennepin and Ramsey. So Ramsey's also a top three. Um, it, but it's simply because there were spider researchers here at the University of Minnesota that at one point were collecting spiders. And so we just know more about spiders in the Twin Cities area than anywhere else. Oddly enough, Blue Earth County is really hot. That's where I'm from. <laughs> it's, the, it's the number two county. Um, I often get asked, are spiders dangerous? Uh, and we need to recognize that these carnivores, they do have a venom. It is designed to do two things. One, incapacitate the prey, make them stop moving. Two, turn everything into liquid because spiders are liquid feeders. They do not have jaws like you and I do. They don't have teeth for chewing or anything. They basically turn it into liquid and then they suck all the parts out, okay? Uh, and so this is normally the twofold purpose of uh, this venom, which, you know, for us, we don't want to be liquefied or immobilized either. Uh, but the good news for you is that the weather outside is not very conducive for us having uh, what we call medically significant spiders here in Minnesota. Um, we, are, we are very fortunate. We do not have many. So uh, one of the ones that's probably the scariest is, is brown recluse. Uh, brown recluse is found in the southern United States. Uh, here in Minnesota, there are three records that I know of. Um, this one fell out of a box at a FedEx distribution center in Mankato, where one of my students said, ooh, that looks cool. Put it in a box and brought it to Professor Hines. It's a brown recluse. Very fun. There was one that was collected historically either in Lake City or Lake County, but wasn't very well noted. Those are in different places, by the way. Um, and then there was one that somebody got in St. Cloud two years ago, three years ago, something like that. Normally what happens is it's a stowaway. You got uh, a couch and it came from a distribution center further south where brown recluses are. It came in with the couch. They don't like this weather and they don't survive. Um, so your likelihood of bumping into a brown recluse, just not very good. It does have a venom that causes local tissue death. And so what happens if it bites you in the arm, it kills the tissue immediately around that wound and then what happens is, if you do not have your skin, which keeps all the other things out of you, it means that you get secondary infections. And that's normally the issue with... Uh, uh, the other type of spiders that we have that are uh, medically significant are widows. Here in Minnesota, there are four species that have been documented. 
The brown widow is the one that was most recently documented. I think that was in the last year. Uh, most widows are also stowaways. Um, they come in on plant material. So, you know, it, it comes spring and, and we start seeing shrubbery and all sorts of things that are for sale at the local garden center. Well, where they get them from? Because it's still snow on the ground, right? <laughs> We're in Minnesota. Well, it came from somewhere else and sometimes they stow away. Um, there is actually a native population of widows here in uh, Minnesota, and they are found down in the southeastern corner. So uh, the red parts of the map, those have confirmed records. So that's Houston, Fillmore, and Winona counties. I have pictures from people. I spent a whole day down in Houston County this spring trying to find one. I couldn't find one. Okay, so they're hard to, to bump into. Um, the blue is where I think that they could also occur. We just don't have any documented records yet. Northern black widow is the species that we expect to be here. Um, black widows have a neurotoxin. Um, and if I was to get bit, I'm probably in the, the healthy range. And so I would feel sick for, for a while and then, then I'd shake it off. It's more harmful for really old people or really young people who are, who are more impacted by it. Um, again, the likelihood of you bumping into one of these, just not very good. And I would have no qualms about having either one of those species walk across my hands because most spiders do not want to bite. It is energetically expensive for them to envenomate you and therefore they don't want to. So I've had numerous spiders walking across my hands. Students are just absolutely shocked that I would let something like that happen, uh, but they are completely harmless for the most part. If I was to try and pick one of these up with my fingers and using my opposable thumb, they don't like that. That's how you get bit. You get one in between your shirt and your body. They don't like that. That's when you'll get bit. So that's typically when you're going to get bit by a spider. It, it doesn't happen. Um, they are not going, oh, I've got to bite someone, I've got to bite someone. It's not like that. They, there are no rabid spiders. That's a totally different, uh, totally different thing. Okay. We'll wrap it up with why you should be interested in uh, spiders. Um, hopefully you already are. Right? This, is, this is just a, a nice uh, uh, finishing. We've talked a little bit about these Habernatus males. These guys are designed to attract the ladies. So this is Viridippes. He's got bright metallic green front legs that he likes to raise like this for her. And in the back, he's got orange little flags on his third leg, which he also likes to show to her. This is that same male, Captiosis, and he's got a little pink hook in the back. This is actually reflective. It's, it's iridescent and reflective. It's outstanding. Um, and then up here on the front, it's really hard to see. I'm going to actually come up here. You can see there's actually like, there's a big thick plume on these bushy yellow legs in the front. So first pair of legs and the third pair of legs are designed to do their elaborate dance for the girls. And so they're just, they're spectacular. Anytime I, I run into one of these habernatus, which isn't very often, um, they are just fun to look at. Some of the most beautiful spiders we have here in Minnesota. Wolf spider moms. We've already seen uh, wolf spiders carrying a little golf ball behind them. You see a spider running along, and you see a little golf ball trailing right behind it. It's a wolf spider. You can impress all your friends with that. Um, they're the only ones that really do that here in Minnesota. Uh, then they hatch, and then mom gives them a piggyback ride. So she will walk around, so all of her eggs have hatched, and now uh, this ground wolf spider is just running around with young ones. Here's a close-up. This is uh, Schizocosa McCookie, and a student brought me this spider, and he says, I don't know what's wrong with it, but it's all lumpy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the young ones hang on to mom for dear life, but eventually someone gets hungry, and somebody gets eaten. And what happens is they eventually spread out. So as she's going along, uh, they'll drop off and, and spread around. Similar are those, those big Dolomini's fishing spiders. They also are uh, great moms. They also carry their egg sacs around with them, but they do it with their chalicerae. So normally it's underneath their legs instead of following behind them. And when they're about to hatch, then she makes a web. So this is in my yard. You can see how many babies are here. She's made a silk web. Here's the, this is newly hatched. So these are two, two members of the genus Dolomedes, and mom is hanging out close by, this is at night, and uh, making sure that nothing happens to them. And eventually they'll disperse from there, and they'll grow up from these little tiny things to 
the giant one that is taking care of them. Black purse web spiders. Um, this is the closest thing we have to a tarantula. Most spider fangs, when they bite, uh, the clicerae kind of go together like this. And so the fang comes in from the side. In mygalomorphs, which are like tarantulas, instead that fang swings out like this, and they, they lean forward to insert the bite. This is the only one that we have that's like that. And I thought it would be here because it's on the Wisconsin list. And uh, many years ago, I found one during a bio blitz with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It walked under someone's boot as we were standing there. But um, the male was described in 1842. We had no idea what the female looked like until 1980. 138 years and no girlfriend. <laughs> Nobody knew what the girl looked like. She never leaves her web. Um, she makes a, a silk purse web that normally is along a root of a tree and sometimes up the side of the tree. It blends in like you wouldn't believe because I haven't found one yet. And uh, she lives inside that her entire life. And the males, the reason we found the males so easy is he's looking for her too. And he's using pheromones, a or, or, or sense, in order to try and track and figure out where she is. And then he'll try and find her. So they're easy to find. The males are easy to find. The females are a lot trickier. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in the southeastern part of Minnesota looking for this species and struck out on that one as well. It's a lot of looking and coming up empty. Trash line orb weavers, they just have kind of a fun name to them. Males have this awesome protuberance on their abdomen. Um, but they, uh, we can look out here, there's a spider there somewhere. She sits right out in the open, right where everybody can see her. She has a meal and she wraps it up. She has a meal and she wraps it up, a meal and she wraps it up, a meal and she wraps it up, and then she sits and looks just like a meal. That got wrapped up. So they kind of sit right out in the open. And these guys are about the size of an eraser. They're pretty, pretty tiny. Pirate spiders. <laughs> They eat other spiders specifically, or they steal from their webs. Um, so they basically walk around looking for spiders in their webs and then either eat the spider or take what they've been stashing for later, um, which is just kind of fun. There's actually a number of spiders that do that, but this one's called a pirate spider, which is kind of fun to say. Ant mimicry is something that's very common uh, in spiders. And it, we actually find it in multiple families. So uh, this is a two-lined, it's called a two-lined ant mimic. And uh, it actually comes in two forms. One's all black with these two white stripes. And there's this one here. They look like they're about the same size as two types of carpenter ants that we have here in Minnesota. So the all black one looks like our Pennsylvania uh, or the black carpenter ant, which is Campanotus pennsylvanicus. And then uh, this one here, which has a dark eye area and then kind of brown, looks closer to another type of carpenter ant, but it's the same species. And we find both different morphs are found uh, kind of throughout the state. But uh, this is a called, what are they called there? They have a very long name, the Corinid ground sack spiders or something like that, some really long name. Um, this is just a type of ground spider, but they have metallic coloration to them. This is called Mycaria gerchi. doesn't really have a common name. This is the ant-like sheet weaver. And these two down here are jumping spiders. And uh, this one on the left is probably my favorite. First time I ever found one, this is what I caught them hanging out with. How's that for mimicry? <laughs> this is called a winter ant. And I learned that afterwards. So you, you go down that road and you start learning different things. But we see the brown coloration, for example, on the abdomen matches about that. And there's a thin, dark area there which is the connection between this and the thorax. So ants have three segments, one, two, three. It's trying to mimic three with its two. And the coloration on the body actually gives you that illusion, which is kind of fun to see. Um, but they wave their first pair of legs around like antenna. So they walk with three, wave the other one, they look like antenna. And what that allows them to do is um, ants aren't exactly the tastiest of organisms. And so they kind of hide in plain sight. They do have their own parasites. There are mites that affect spiders. This is a, a parasitic fly. So a fly has come in here. It has laid its egg on the abdomen. And now the, if you would, the maggot of our fly is feasting on the in, 
inside of the spider. Uh, and so eventually, if I had not stuck this in alcohol, uh, this would have hatched out and we would have had a new fly. There are also a uh, whole group of, uh, there's a whole family of wasps called the pompilids. They're called the spider wasps. And guess what they eat? They're hunting spiders, yeah? Um, spiders eat spiders. We talked about that already. Birds eat spiders. So, I mean, they have, uh, they have their share of uh, predators as well. So we're not going to ever become overwhelmed by uh, spiders. Um, there are some non-native species that are found here in Minnesota. They have found their way via a, a different uh, means. Uh, the house spider, Tegenaria domestica, uh, very common in basements of homes. Uh, this is Trichosa ruricola. It's a, uh, a wool spider that um, is spreading east to west and has arrived in Minnesota in the last 10 years. Um, these two jumping spiders are real common on buildings normally in the company of one another. So you'll, you'll find normally mostly this or mostly this, but you'll normally find both on there. Uh, this guy eats the little roly polies. This is called a woodlouse hunter. Incidentally, it also has only six eyes. Um, this is all called a house spider. Uh, if you're a subscriber to the Minnesota Conservation Volunteer, they had a, information in there about that spider on their most recent episode. Uh, this is called the cross spider, but this is the cross spider from Europe. Uh, Arrhenius diademonis, and this is the first county record from Blue Earth County. It's only it's it's slowly spreading from Wisconsin into Minnesota. So for a while, it was only found in the Twin Cities and Rochester. It's now found in outlying areas around Rochester, and uh, for the first time this fall, we had one uh, in Blue Earth County, right by the hospital. I wonder if there's a connection. Uh, and then this one is one that. Um, if I had to go back, if I was going to just focus on, on uh, ecological research, I would look at this spider here. This is called the candy stripe spider. Um, it is also spreading east to west across the state of Minnesota. Um, it first uh, emerged in the Mississippi River Valley, and it is gradually spreading further and further west. I think that this species actually is disruptive to the ecological communities in forest understories. I, I don't have the proof for it, but um, just... Anywhere that I find this spider, normally I'm missing things that uh, the native species that would otherwise be found in the woods that I would expect. Uh, and they tend to come in and they take over. They come in two different color forms, the pink one and the spotted one. Um, but they're found uh, kind of all over uh, Minnesota. We're not getting rid of them, but they're kind of interesting to study them for that reason. During the process of uh, me studying spiders, I, uh, I did find a couple of new things. I'm just going to go real quick here. This was only the second known record from North America. So European species, not supposed to be here, um, found it just walking around in the woods on the Bethany campus. Um, since then, I have found it. Uh, it's been found in Hennepin County, Pine County, and just this fall, I found it in Lesseur County at a wildlife management area under a piece of corrugated metal, a whole colony of them. Don't know why they're here. Um, the guy who wrote the book on this particular genus says, I have no idea why they're there. He and I agree. This is an undescribed species. I know what genus it's in. I found it. I collected it. I said, oh, that's different. Keyed it out. There's two species that have been described in North America. This is a third one. It's undescribed. So if I ever want to uh, uh, put a name to it, I could go through the formal description of it. I just know it doesn't match the other two. Both the palp structure as well as its size is, is straight out. And it's probably one that's found on the Great Plains. So far, I've only found two adult males. So I haven't found the girl yet, which I keep telling myself, as long as I don't find the girl, I don't have to describe it. Okay? Um, and there are other things. I honestly, I, I do bumble into things. That I, I just don't know what they are. Um, and these are five other spiders that I don't know. The two on the right are in the genus Aegynita, which is a type of sheet web spider. This is the male, and I think this is his girlfriend. I collected them the same day in the same habitat. I think it's a boy and girl pairing, and I can't find anything that matches them. Um, so that's kind of exciting as well. So I do have a boy and a girl if I want to formally describe them. Um, but uh, I got too many other things to do. There's lots of resources. Unlike when I started, there's lots of books now. Um, this is in its second edition. This one came out since I started. This one came out since I started. This one came out just last year. This one's been around forever, but covers the entire world in a little tiny book. Not very much. 
I recognize, uh, I recommend uh, Bug Guide as another great resource. I serve as a uh, uh, an editor on that site and help people identify spiders and help to organize the spider information that's on there. Um, and I also have uh, the checklist to Minnesota spiders is available here. If you picked up my handout, it's listed on there as well. Uh, and there's also a project on iNaturalist. If you've ever played around with that website, you can post pictures of spiders that you come across here in Minnesota. And every day I go through and identify all the spiders uh, that get posted on that website. Um, so today there were five, which is nice about winter. It's some downtime. I can focus on other things. The summer, it's maybe an hour to two hours a day um, to help people identify spiders. But that's how we find, we've actually found maybe five or six new state records from just average people, just taking taking pictures and seeing something they just hadn't seen before. That's how I got started. Uh, I hope that's what starts it off for you. <laughs> and it's really hard for me to gauge how long I actually went, because I, I, was, I was told to be done at three, but I couldn't tell if all this stuff. And we're not going to worry about it. If you have questions, you can ask questions. I did bring samples of books. I did bring spiders um, from my collection. I have uh, over 2,800 vials in my collection at this point. I brought them up, and so if you wanted to come up and look at them, and uh, Bailey provided me with magnifying glasses, which you need for some of them. Um, but you can come up and look at them, too. You don't have to. Uh, if you need to run, you can just come up and look at that sort of thing. Otherwise, I'll, I'll take whatever questions. In the back. I have asked the same question. If you have a lot of spiders, it probably means you have other other pest issues. So uh, that's that's one of the one of the challenges. I think honestly, it's probably a gig. They could make money off of it. If you go into the southern United States, brown recluse, black widow. Okay, okay now that's a little bit different. You know, um, but you know, a lot of these, like the orchid, orchid kind of covers the entire nation. So, um, big book works in the south, we can get people to do it in the north. And some people just don't like spiders. And so that's kind of reassuring to them as well. I personally, I don't see a lot of spiders in my home. Um, and I don't see, if there, if there aren't any dangerous ones. I've looked. Other questions? Have there been any recently found spiders? Uh, I showed that one that I found that was new to Minnesota. And then those ones that I showed on just a couple slides ago, the ones that I said were unknown, I, I don't know anybody who knows what they are. So those would be brand spanking new. And those were collected last summer. You might see that new spider again. But there's new ones that are out there to be found. Most of them are probably pretty tiny because people tend to notice the big ones. In the back. So do you find these spiders tiny in their name? Well, if you can describe it, you get to name. So what I would have to do if I was going to uh, actually formally go through the naming process, I would need to go through, at this point, it's, it's gotten into where you have to do DNA work. So I would actually need to take part of the spider, grind it up, extract the DNA, and put probably the DNA barcode uh, available online for people to compare it to. I would have to compare that barcode to every other known barcode for every other member of that genus. I would have to formally describe how the palp structure and the epigenome structure is completely different from all of the other ones that are in that family. Which keeps me from doing it. It's a lot of work. Yeah, so I would, because I, I, I only have, I think I have only three species of Aegina that I've actually found. Of the 12 to 15 that I think actually might be here in Minnesota. And so I don't have that much of a, a, a breath to, to really know what I'm looking at yet, which means I would probably have to reach out to museums and other collectors in order to get their samples uh, and then have them send them to me. Then I have to look and compare all of them and then redo the whole key and try to figure out where, see, you can, you can just kind of feel how much work that is. And I'm doing this mostly on the side. I've got a full-time job teaching students at this point, so um, it's not a priority. But they're in alcohol, so that, that's why I tried not to, when I first got into this, I tried not to collect, I was collecting them, taking their picture, and releasing 
I was a champion until I ran into that whole clubby old issue where you can't tell the difference between the males and the females unless you actually look at them. That's when I started collecting, and that's where I got serious more about the science side of things because I realized as I was going along, I really was doing science. I, I'm doing cutting edge research right here in Minnesota because nobody knows that. So what I'm doing is cutting edge, not because it's amazing and there's lasers and stuff like that, but just because we don't know enough about it. Uh, what kind of photo equipment do you always have in your car in case you see something? I always have jars. <laughs> always. My wife laughs at me. I, I have little collection jars that are about that big, and uh, they have pre-made labels that are in them. There's just a little piece of 100% cotton paper, and uh, that's just so that I can uh, uh, label them so I know when I collected it, where I collected it, that sort of thing. And uh, normally they end up, um, I'll, I'll take pictures. You, you might notice, I take a lot of pictures of live spiders. I, I'm still trying to, and there's, there's other people too, especially with the, the, the boom in digital photography and, and websites like iNaturalist and uh, Bug Guide. There's a number of people who are trying to get it so that we actually do understand field marks so we don't have to preserve them. That we can actually tell the difference between those two club yoga. That's going to happen. I think there are still some that are getting very tricky. But there's uh, there are patterns that are starting to emerge because people are taking pictures of them. I normally take a picture of them, then put them in alcohol, then take pictures of them, then take pictures of dissected parts. And especially for some families, the most recent literature on the, the family uh, dictinity goes back to 1958. It is not, it's definitive in the sense that nobody else has done anything on it, but the pictures don't help much. And um, I think I probably have some new spiders that are in that family too. Um, but because, I'm, because that family is so poorly known, I am now, as a rule, I take a picture of it while it's alive. I take a picture of it, preserved top side, preserved bottom side, uh, the epigenome pre-dissection, post-dissection stained, top side, post-dissection stained, bottom side. It's ridiculous. It's a whole series of pictures. But the whole reason I'm doing that is so that maybe down the road, somebody can just look at it and say, that's what that is. Um, but somebody's got to do that documentation and do that work. So. I, I, I oftentimes have a sweet net, um, which you just kind of sweep things with uh, in order to catch things. Sometimes I throw that in. Um, but honestly, I catch a lot with just my hands in jars. It's spiders are easy to catch, by the way. Put the jar in front of them. They go, ooh, a tight and close space I can hide in. They're in. <laughs> um, some of them are fast and will try and run away. But honestly, if you give them a, a nice tight space, that's where they want. Uh, in the lack of knowledge about spider diversity, Yes. Yes. So, like, my colleagues aren't in Minnesota. My colleagues are the people that I know uh, that I've met through the American Arachnological Society or who I've bonded with just over, uh, uh, just over Bug Guide and I Naturalist, where I'm one of the experts, accidentally somehow became an expert. One, at one point, somebody said, when you say you move that image for the experts, who exactly are you referring to? And that's when I realized. Oh, I am an expert. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can't say that anymore. I, I, I am one of those experts. I, I didn't set out to become an expert in spider, but that was kind of an epiphany. Like, well, I actually do know something. Um, but most of my colleagues are people uh, far away. So one of my colleagues is at uh, uh, Indianapolis University, and he specializes in dwarf spiders, which are the toughest ones to identify. But um, he and I regularly go back and forth because I don't know everything. And he focuses on that one taxonomic group. And so a lot of times he bails me out and kind of points me in a different direction, helps me get out of my tunnel vision, thinking about one thing and starts helping me think about other things. And because the distributions are sort of poorly known, like I have spiders in my collection and the closest record is New York. So what happened in Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, and all these other states where it must be, but nobody's doing any work. So I would say our ignorance is huge. But this is a great time to get into spiders because all the books are here. Are spiders or different families, species of spiders, susceptible to climate change? Or are they fairly reasonable? Great question. Uh, I have to say that all the ignorance that we have just about their distributions right now kind of lends itself to our ignorance about that as well. 
Um, that is that is a great question, but um, uh, you know, spiders work in more microclimates than macroclimates as well. Um, and 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 I don't know of too much research. I know, I think in the last last. Uh, journal, uh, there was somebody who was trying to at least get some baseline information. Uh, and, and some of the distribution work that I'm doing would probably be considered baseline information. Like we now know that these are found, uh, you know, I have, I have, uh, I, I made the map specifically for the, for the, for the Black Widow, um, but I have some range maps because I'm, I'm much more visual. I'd rather just look at a map than go down the list of counties, for example. Um, and you know, some of those things are starting to fill in and I'm starting to understand where they are. And then every once in a while, there's an outlier that suggests, oh, maybe it's found in the entire state. I don't know. Um, and again, we're just too ignorant. We just don't know enough. So lots of opportunity to learn. Great question. Uh, so again, they're behind bark. You can find a behind bark pretty easily. Um, they will bury down in the leaf litter. They are actually some that are active all winter long. But in the cold, they move about this fast. <laughs> and so uh, their prey also moves about that fast. Still works out. Um, but you get a nice, warm, sunny day in February. Uh, it's not too unusual to find spiders crawling across the top of the snow, um, roaming around. So uh, buried in the leaf litter, um, you know, we could go out and look for spiders. It's, just, it's harder to find them uh, in the winter than it is in the uh, summer. But they just basically fill their bodies with antifreeze and they don't freeze solid. Some of them overwinter as adults, some of them overwinter as eggs, some of them overwinter as juveniles, some of them overwinter as one molt away from becoming an adult. And all different different families and different genera are at different stages of maturity and mature at different stages too. So the, the big orb weavers normally start maturing after July 4th. So they overwinter as juveniles and then they'll become adults. The adults die once the frost. Year to year two. Um, this past year, I was amazed at how many old jumpers. It's a big black jumping spider with a white smiley face on its abdomen and bright green, uh, had a real shiny chelicerae up in the front. And they were everywhere this year. Everybody found them, almost every single county. It was crazy. Uh, it was just everywhere. And I've never seen that like that. And probably next year it won't be there. It's, it, uh, every year it varies. And the same thing is true of the, the two species of our Jayapi. So um, that's the big black and yellow orb weaver. There's a banded version of this too. And those populations go up and down. Uh, and I don't understand it quite yet. It seems like it might be a geographical thing, or it might be a this year better than that year, or I don't know what affects the population dynamics. But I'll walk through a prairie one year, it'll be one species. The next year I'll walk through, it'll be the other one. Well, where would the other one go? Um, they may have ballooned and just flown off, and they're now downwind. You know, all the young are blew away. So they're three prairies over or something like that. I don't know. Um, and that's part of the fun. There's still a lot of questions that we can answer. Yes? Um, there's yes. Are there any spiders that live underwater? Now, in Minnesota, we don't really have any that go under the water. The fishing spiders do sometimes end up on top of the water. We'll, we'll take a fish or some type of like a dragonfly nymph or something like that uh, right at the surface. But over in Europe, they do have a spider that actually will take air and will, will make a silk uh, bell, essentially. It will take air from the top and it will fill up the bell with air. So he can basically crawl around underneath Water. We don't have that here in Minnesota, but it sounds cool, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there's a picture of that one in this little book here. I think they got a picture of one. In Is that my cue? Am I getting? Actually, far? you're not. Oh, okay. You're not. Oh, 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 online people that are coming through. Yeah, yeah. So, are there any spiders endemic to Minnesota? We can I, talk about those. I don't know. Mm. Still working on it. Okay. Uh, since I have undescribed species, yes. I just don't know what they are. Great. Um, where are county records stored? On my computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I have a matrix that has the spider species down the left-hand side and the counties that go across the top. 
and that is how I track everything. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the one. So I, this talk had to come first, but the DNR has me, I'm supposed to assign uh, conservation values to the entire spider list for Minnesota. So um, that's my January work. Wow. So <laughs> I'm the guy who knows stuff. Um, what is the best way to photograph a spider for ID? Okay, if you want to photograph a spider for ID, um, uh, get close. Seeing eight legs in a black blotch doesn't help much. Uh, get close. Don't worry. It won't, it won't bite you. Um, it might run away from you. Um, but uh, get close. Try and get the top side. Um, if you can, get the eye arrangement. And be prepared that you might not have got the right shot. As somebody who's taken a million pictures of birds, yeah, sorry, spiders, shift gears. <laughs> person who's taken a lot of pictures of spiders, you will think you've got every angle that you need until you find out you didn't get the right one. Um, so just take a bunch of pictures, and, and uh, that's the secret. And you'll learn as you go. Um, what is the biggest challenge you foresee with spider diversity? Climate change, invasive species, habitat loss? Pesticides. Pesticides. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I, get a, I get a little nervous uh, with some of the, some of the things that, that we're doing again. You know, I, I feel sometimes we're like kind of recycling Silent Spring again. Um, where some of the pesticides and things that we're using, we're kind of spreading and, and um, they're doing wonderful things for our crops, but we're not really measuring what's doing to the other things. Um, and so I, I would put that probably at the top of my list, uh, along with probably habitat loss. Um, I was talking to, I didn't catch your name, but I was talking to her before and I showed her a, a picture of uh, a jumping spider. So there's this beautiful, actually I have a picture here. I just, just remembered always bring extras that's always leave them wanting more okay i'm gonna move this off to the side okay. it's just fine so this shiny jumper gorgeous right um there's historic records from ramsey county it's a it's a bog specialist where are the bogs in ramsey county there's a couple but we don't even know if this spider is there it has been documented probably since the 1980s um, that's the southern end of its distribution. And, and it took me, uh, I found my first one, and I thought, oh, good, now I think I know what I'm looking for. And started looking at habitats, and I was wrong, wrong, wrong. And then I found it in another one. And then I'm trying to figure out, okay, if it's in both of these habitats, then what habitat is it found in? And then I have to find that again. And I went to St. Louis County, I said, I, I told uh, Clinton Neenhouse, who's the naturalist up at Saxon Bog, I said, hey, we need to find a bog. It needs to have tussocks. He said, I know exactly where to go. First sweep of the net we have. It. But that habitat, as we go, uh, as we undergo development, um, is, is, is starting to uh, come into play, um, that not just for spiders, but for other organisms. And then probably the other side of that that comes in there, too, is just we do have non-native species that are, uh, that are coming in. And um, we don't know what the effect is of, of non-native spiders, because not enough people are studying spiders to be in so. Go ahead. I know you have I one more I just have there. one more here. Um, oh, from this is questions from a four-year-old. They want to <laughs> identify that. What happens if spiders get into the water? Oh, what do they do if they get into the water? Mm -hmm. Well, water normally is not good for spiders. Most of them can't swim. Um, most of them drown. Um, I actually use that as a, a means of catching spiders, too. Um, I can put out a passive trap. And the spiders just bumble into it and they drown. Mm -hmm. um, but long term, then they just turn into moldy things. So I don't do that a lot because it, it means I have to check the trap like once or twice a day. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, some of the spiders, they just walk right across the surface of the water. Um, so it might not even face them at all. Fishing spiders just dance right across the top. Mm -hmm. And then the last one. Uh, do you ever do field trips? We can join on a spider hunt. Oh, that sounds like fun. Um I uh, I have not done a, a public field trip in a while. Um, for a while, I was up at Tabernacle Nature Center once a year doing a drop-in station where I went out with uh, kids and we went and swept a bunch. And I've done kids programs a couple other places. Um, I have not done that recently, probably because COVID got me out of the habit of doing that. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, I typically am out. I, I do bio blitzes with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Friends of Saxon Bog, and I think Jen Vleet has me uh, lined up for Carpenter Nature Center at some point this summer. So I don't have any that I've planned, but um, 
Yeah, maybe sometime down the road. Maybe we could talk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Chad, so sure. much. And if you have questions or if you want to see some of the specimens up close or some of those resources, please feel free to um, come on up after we finish here. Thank you again. I just did want to mention our next speaker series is with John Moriarty on butterfly introductions. That's happening on January 28th. That's Sunday, still Sunday time slot from two to three. All right. That's all I have for right now. Thank you all so much for your patience and your grace. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you again. And this is